Okay, recording goes on. Everybody has to say, got it, it's okay, that you're going to be recorded for eternity. Uh, thank you everyone for being here. You never know how many will actually show up. I think we had 50 registered, so who knows, we might get different people every week. But I'm very uh, appreciative of everybody who does show up. It shows already to me that you're a person of concern about, about our world and what we can do about it to, to build a world that works for everyone, which uh, is certainly not the case today. Usually I would jump into uh, a class like this and overwhelm you with a hundred PowerPoints <laughs> slides, right, Ibrahima? <laughs> I have had a tendency to go very quickly through a lot of information. I wanted to start off this class in a, in a different manner, a little more Socratic uh, with some, some uh, uh, two or three uh, questions. And I'm going to ask you to maybe take a note or just a note in your mind, these questions so that, that you can respond. And I have a little timer here. I think we'll keep the response to the first question, which can be a fairly quick response uh, to about one minute each person. And then maybe the second, second or third, third question, maybe we'll, we'll have a couple of minutes. Uh, why am I doing this Socratic approach? It's to to get to know who is actually here, what are your thoughts, ideas, orientations, and experiences, so that when uh, we do do more of the uh, didactic PowerPoints uh, in the future classes, I'll be able to kind of craft and form and shape it according to the, the mindset or worldview, uh, values, uh, and so forth, and experiences of you who are in the class. So I'm hoping that this will help us make it uh, more uh, personally and interpersonally interesting and useful. Uh, I'll no doubt be sharing some things about my life that led me to being here with you all today. Uh, and the Henry George, uh, what I sometimes call the perennial wisdom teachings around economics that Henry George independently discovered from from very deeply asking uh, his own questions. And in the quest of his questions, uh, eventually some profound truth revealed itself to him. And then he wrote his masterwork, Progress and Poverty, which launched him to considerable fame quite quickly. And within a short time, he found himself um, traveling, lecturing to big audiences throughout the United States, uh, uh, Ireland, um, Australia even. And we have Henry George schools in several countries that were the result of his lectures. So um, he even ran, you're all, I guess, not necessarily, but some of you live in New York. In the latter part of the 1800s, Henry George did uh, did go uh, and run for mayor of New York City two times. And he had a tremendous amount of support. Uh, there was probably corruption in the elections the first time. He could well have won, but a lot of his votes were thrown in the rivers there in New York. And uh, the second time, even though he was not that of good health, he ran for a second time. And uh, near the end of that campaign, he had a stroke. But he has had given us uh, a movement that has continued on. Uh, it's an inter international movement. He wrote, in addition to Crimes and Poverty, he wrote Social Problems. Uh, his last book was The Science of Political Economy. He wrote in The Question of Labor. <laughs> so uh, he came to see that what he had come to understand had actually been um, addressed previous to his, what seemed at the time an independent discovery, both the principles and the policies uh, to address, which will be a major concern here, uh, wealth inequality. And in fact, how can we have maximum fairness and freedom? So for instance, how can we create a fair, free market? Is that even possible? Can we synergize the values of freedom and fairness. So um, with that little introduction here, 
are the questions. I uh, wanted to say one more thing. I also wanna make this class relevant to current events, the kind of things that you would read in newspapers, online, coming in through media, because you'll be amazed as you get deeply into this true science of political economy, how relevant it is to so many issues today. And until you see it at the depth we'll be presenting it, you, you might not be able to connect the dots uh, of the many uh, and the, the variety of the many problems that we have. But um, hopefully by the end, one, you'll be able to connect those dots. Two, you'll be able to see that what we'll be presenting is important and valuable and needs to be brought forth in the world. And lastly, for the very last, the, the fifth session, you're gonna get a, a nice warm invitation from me to, to join our movements that are working to make real, to implement the policies that we'll be describing and talking about. So you're going to be invited to step up as much as you are able, a few minutes a week or however you can, many hours is to be up to you, but you are gonna get an invitation to act in the real world to create a post-economics uh, system that works for everybody, local to global. So here are the questions. Uh, what are the economic and social crises we are facing? You all could probably come up with 10 at the drop of a dime, but that's the one question that's gonna begin us. And uh, uh, I'll see, able to see you raise your hand or, or raise a hand uh, in the reactions panel of Zoom. And then we'll each have about a minute to answer what are the economic and social crises we are facing. If you like, then we'll go to what effect has this had on your own life? That, that's sort of a personal question, no need to uh, address or answer that, but if you'd like to say at all how these economic and social crises have impacted your own life, you're welcome to do so. And then the last uh, of these uh, short list of questions is, what in your view are some principles and policies for a post COVID economics. So be thinking about that as we go along till we get to the one that is what in your view are some principles and policies for post COVID economics. I am pretty sure most all of you have some thoughts on that. So, okay. Um, Who's gonna let's go first? Start. Yeah, who wants to go first? What are the economic and social crises we are facing. I guess they could also put it in chat. Would that be permissible, Abrahima? Uh, yes, the chat is actually open and I'm monitoring. Yes, yes, good. So um, we will unmute you. This can be short responses, but you have up to a minute to share your thoughts on economic and social crisis we're facing. Is that okay. Douglas with his hand up? Now we need to unmute Douglas. You need to. Uh, uh, he could do it. Yes. I'm, okay, I'm okay. unmuted now. Yeah. The, Good. To me, the uh, the major thing is economic inequality. I live in California, and Jeff Bezos is flying off into space with billions of dollars, and meanwhile, there's people living in tents on the uh, street corners. And it's just not right. I mean, to me, it's almost criminal how, how the system works. And so I'm looking toward, well, I'm 83 years old, so I'm, I'm not, I'm a retired federal employee. I was in oceanography. And uh, so I'm trying to learn about taxes. I, and I, come across Henry George and Michael Hudson and Fred Harrison and uh, Ed Dodson and all your friends. And mm -hmm. uh, I think they've got the answer. So I'm looking toward a land value tax and a universal basic income, but it won't happen in my life. It might happen in Eastern Canada in the, in the Maritimes. 
uh, if you re follow on Facebook, uh, some uh, web pages called Universal Basic Income Canada, or uh, they look like they're closer to at least than, than the United States. Um, and then I'm also worried about climate change and how all these things are going to coalesce or are they yeah. coming to a crisis point? Yeah. And uh, I, I won't live to see it out, but you people might. <laughs> That's the end. Well, the we, we, as long as we're here, we can do something to, to bring it into place more fully. So we're going to be addressing all of that. Thank you. Okay. You've already already sure. looked quite a bit at uh, some of the key issues here and the people that are presenting and writing about it. Okay, next person. We're on economic and social crises, just to list some that you... There is, a, there is a comment in the chat from uh, Jen. Uh, significant okay. wage wealth gaps, racial inequality, disruption to supply chains. Interesting. And inflation. Okay. I'm taking some notes as uh, we go along. So one of the points that he, uh, Jen raised are already mentioned by Douglas. That's the inequality mm -hmm. bit. But the discussion mm -hmm. of uh, supply chains, I believe that uh, relates to free trade and globalization. I think uh, we were not aware of some of these vulnerabilities, but I think uh, the COVID crisis just really made it very, very plain. And that has something to do with inflation because uh, if you have a disruption in the supply chains, uh, world trade is affected. And world trade is really one of the reasons how we here in the United States were able to control inflation, you know? Because when prices rise here, you open up your borders, uh, you get the Chinese to, uh, to ship cheap goods to the United States, and it, it plays on, uh, it uh, kind of moderates the prices. So if you have a disruption that was not planned for, you get a, this kind of scenario. And it was felt, I think, all over the world. So that's one vulnerability. Oh. The, the, the last couple of, uh, the last two decades, everything we've been hearing is free trade was great. Globalization is the way to go. What happened with the crisis show that we really need to pause and, and rethink our strategy. Ron, you want and, to start? Uh, well, I would um, just uh, maybe add the, um, the issue of uh, growth in the coming decades and that, um, uh, obviously, it relates to um, both inequality and to the climate crisis, but uh, we have to ask the question, uh, what is growth? Who needs to grow? Who perhaps needs to slow down their growth? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, so um, I think this issue has to be deconstructed and, and look at the, um, you know, the um, negative uh, consequences of, of growth as well as the positive ones, because oftentimes growth is given as a solution to all problems. Good. So these are concerns that we're saying. That this, the, so the crisis would be the crisis of some kind of issue around growth, as we're looking at economic and social crises that we're facing. And then of course the inequality and climate again. Okay, next person. Thanks, Ron. Cuba, Your thoughts on Cuba, go ahead. Yep. Hello, my name is Kuba. Um, I am the economic research assistant for the Henry George School. Um, so I have some some knowledge of economics, hopefully. Um, so the thing is, what I've uh, two things I actually would say are big um, problems that we have now today: economic and social issues. First thing I would say is uh, climate change. Um, that spans more than just economic and social crises. It spans 
because there's any uh, just a, a major crisis in general in the world. Um, but I'm not going to say too much about it, as we all know, climate change um, is is a real I'd say it's a real threat to just uh, to society, to society in large uh, and to you know the U.S. economy, the world economy, global economy. Um, another issue, uh, another crisis I think that we do have right now is housing. Um, both house housing or housing home prices, apartment prices, and also just rent as well. So a lot of the times, um, well, a lot of times people always struggle. A lot of people struggle, you know, to pay their rent. It's it's high. They pay an absurd percentage of their wages, uh, you know, for rent. Let's see, it's like fifty percent more, you know, um, more than half of the time you know, they're working. They have to, you know, whatever they make from their time at work, you know, they're going to put towards just rent itself. And, you know, we can't forget that people have other expenses as well. Um, and I would also say that the, the whole entire COVID uh, crisis that we had now for the past more than a year now, um, it's shown how vulnerable people are just to, um, you know, just to living, uh, I mean, to, to living uh, on living, you know, in a house, in a house, in an apartment that, you know, that they rent, as we've seen now, um, we've had rent freezes going on, uh, there was an eviction um, moratorium, uh, you know, nobody could be evicted, but that is slowly, that's slowly going to end. And so uh, a lot of people just can't afford to uh, rent, you know, rent the places that they're staying at. And that's a big issue. Um, and besides that, also home prices, as we've seen during COVID, uh, home prices have skyrocketed in so many uh, so many areas in the US and just around the world. And it's insane to think about, you know, how much the homes have gone up. Their value itself hasn't really changed. Like it's still the same house, but just because people want to move out of cities, they want, you know, they want bigger spaces to live in. So housing prices went up. I think that's also another crisis that we have. Because for me, I'm, I'm still rather young. But when I try to think about getting a house, um, if I look at, you know, housing prices now, unless I move, go somewhere more rural, um, you know, finding a house in the suburbs right now is really expensive, really hard to do. So that's not a crisis, I would say, not, not just that I have, but a lot of people, a lot of younger people have. Um, so, yeah. Yes, when uh, I was, thank you, Kuba, when I was a, a younger person, I faced a similar housing dilemma, which led to me leaving San Francisco and Oakland, California, and moving back to my my home grounds of rural Pennsylvania. And I'm glad I did it. I still get to come into New York and the cities, but I have affordable, much more affordable housing. Uh, more on that later. Uh, but before now, those of you who recently came in, we're, we're contemplating the question of just simply saying how we see our current economic and social crises that we're facing. So I wanna hear from everybody on that one. If you wanna say anything about how it affects your own life as Cuba just shared, the dilemma around affordable housing. And then we'll, after we keep considering that first question, then we'll move on to what in your view are some principles and policy for post COVID economics, the setting us up for uh, our future classes. Uh, mentioning also the housing crisis issue uh, and the lack of affordability uh, and lack of purchasing capacity for basic need. Uh, I want to right away, before we move to the next person, get ready to respond, please. Is this, uh, you can't see, you can't see me, I guess, now. This is an article from today from commondreams.org. It's called Alabama Miners Take Strike to Black Rock's New York City Headquarters. So he had a thousand United Mine Workers people uh, in, in your New York City at the Black Rock headquarters. Now, this is a homework assignment for you guys who uh, care to do a little homework research. I want you to get into what is Black Rock. Black Rock is just an enormous, one of the top owners of wealth. And BlackRock has been buying a lot of the housing stock at this time. So if you have some huge pool of money buying the housing stock, that is going to increase the prices of housing for average people who are trying to afford housing. So I think we've got to really look at this player called BlackRock and that, that, that just has massive ownership of wealth now. And we're gonna to need to then ask 
how would the policies that we'll be presenting and that many of us are working for arduously, how would this address BlackRock and affect BlackRock? So with that little teaser, I want you guys to keep looking at key newspaper and media stories that you come across that could be relevant to talk about here. But you might want to look at Common Dreams and look at that one I'm referring to, Alabama Miners Take Strike to Black Rock, New York City Headquarters. All right, next person to uh, share uh, on know, there is a, what you see as our major economic and uh, social problems. There is a crisis question in the that chat. we're facing. There's a question in the chat from uh, Paul Brooks. You, you want, okay. Which is uh, uh, very similar to the issues that Cuba mentioned, the housing issue. Uh, quite interesting because what we are noticing since uh, 2008 is the, the World, World Street, uh, Wall Street uh, financial institutions are getting into the housing business. So we, we, they are, we are basically having a new kind of landlord that is rising that we, you could call the corporate landlord. So it's really driving prices and really putting houses uh, out of reach for the common people. It's another problem. If it continues, we're gonna become a nation of renters. But anyway, let's go to Paul's point. He said, economic and social crisis, and everyone pays taxes, but generally only those who have no money for land are paying rent. Those who have money for land collect rent from those who do not. While the disparity between classes is an important issue, and more importantly, the disparity between those who pay rent and those who do not. So that's a very brilliant way of putting it, uh, uh, Paul. So yes, what's your take on that, Alana? Yes, well, it's not <laughs> it's not set up fair that you can uh, write off your payments for land or housing from what you owe the government. That's obviously highly unfair. So it's a really important point that Paul is making. Um, we, we're gonna want to address that concern as we go along. So he says, those who have money for land collect rent from those who do not. Uh, that's uh, economist Michael Hudson often makes that point that uh, rent, privatized rent that you get from owning property is often used to then buy more property, more land. Uh, so we have to find uh, what Michael, Michael also has called the Achilles heel of capitalism. And when I say capitalism, I'm, I'm talking monopoly capitalism. And I'm saying uh, that's definitely different than uh, a market system. That monopoly capitalism is anything but a free fair market. Uh, and in addressing this, in languaging it and our policies, I want to say that how we with Henry George see this policies and principles is absolutely out of the left right box. That left right, Republican, Democrat, however you call it, are ways, very clever ways that the um, top echelons keep us very divided as a body politic. It's a thousands of years old divide and conquer tactic. Uh, we're gonna really need to move out of that box where we can build, build movements that, that actually have momentum uh, to put uh, new principles and policies in place. So enough on that from me. Others still who would like to address, share your views on what you see as our major economic and social crises right now. All right, uh, Warren. Hi, Alana. Uh, thank you, Ibrahim. Hi. Um, one of the problems that we have, and I was listening to Robert Pollan and Kay Rayworth in Rethinking Economics yesterday, they, they had a, um, a chat, and we are in a real conundrum in that in order to grow, you know, or we, can't, we can't grow for, forever on a finite planet and that's what we're on yet in order to help people out we need to grow and that's generally using fossil fuels as as our as our problem 
Um, so <laughs> you, you were, it's a real conundrum. How do you do two things at once and not have and find the equilibrium? Um, that is the, the sweet spot of the donut economics. That That's Kate's um, um, theory. She admitted yesterday that her donut doesn't really work because in order to help people out, we need, we need to use fossil fuels to help them out because that's what Hudson is, will also will say, um, we have a fossil fuel economy. It's everything runs on fossil fuels. So this is a real problem. Like, uh, what and what do you think of renewable? Actually, uh, many well, re re renew renewable, renewable. Let me, let me actually, get there. Actually really, let me, go ahead, let, me, let me get there. Uh, many countries are getting close to what they call grid parity, saying basically uh, the amount of energy that they produce using renewable is almost getting close to what they would use, you know? So I believe if energy is a question, what about switching? And uh, all we need to do in that case is just to, to manage the transition. Of course, I know oil, oil may not be uh, economically relevant, but it's still gonna be politically relevant. So that's very obvious. We are still we are still decades away from getting getting off of oil, and we are not. Trust me, we're going breakneck speed in ter in terms of um, getting getting renewables there. And geothermal is also the latest one that's having a real resurgence. Uh -huh. um, World Economic Forum had a, had a bit that was showing how geothermal has enough power for the whole world for the next 300 years. Exactly. Um, yeah, so, but geothermal is, was very expensive and same, same thing with like desalination. It's, it's heavily energy intensive, uh, like getting, getting at the geothermal, it's not everywhere. Like you, you look at Iceland is the, is the prime example of using geothermal, right? They have enough geothermal to power all of Europe. But how do you how do you get it there? How do you get it to the mainland? Yeah, but you have so, all the options. Uh, I, I I don't know if it's Douglas or someone else. We had a an attendee that just uh, discussed alternatives like nuclear energy, but that is something called cold fusion, for example. Right. Which is which is safer than what we have right now, and uh, apparently cheap. Those who did physics, like Yanis, probably could just. Uh, uh, step in to, to, to give more details on that. But I believe the science is there for us to move. Maybe what's going to uh, act as a break to uh, switching is probably the vested interests that are behind those, those kind of industries. But I think if there is enough mobilization of public opinion, uh, that can be, can be addressed. But my question about Kate is not, uh, Kate's book is not uh, where the growth is the problem or not. My problem is the problem has never been growth. What we've been hearing from supply side economists since the 1980s is get the pie bigger, grow the pie, and then everybody will be uh, satisfied because the distribution problem will take care of itself. Okay? So uh, they have- Well, a, well, well, well Chuck Collins- well, Let we'll, me finish. We'll, all right, go ahead. Let me finish, yeah. So they have this, uh, what they call the, 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 there is a, an interesting phrase that they use saying a rising tide will lift all boats. So what we have seen is most of the growth that's been happening, and I think you agree with me, it's not benefiting everybody. So I think the focus should be shifted from the growth question to the distribution problem. The biggest problem we have is distribution of income. Go ahead. Well, you have you have Chuck Collins's book that just came out that talk, talks about the the global wealth hiding industry that my father is a part of. You have <laughs> jur jurisdictions that will let people park their money there and get away from from that. And also, if you read the Code of Capital book, it talks about the idea for a trust. Like trusts are the are over a thousand year old. Um, Alana was 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 pointing this out to us. So 
having having like I was watching an interview with Pistor recently, and she was describing all the all the all the stuff. And so, you know, unless we're talking about how to, how to get um, laws changed internationally and getting real enforcement in in these areas, we're going to have the same issue. So. Um... Warren, thanks for all that input. I have a phrase that I like that makes sense to me called dynamic equilibrium around growth. You know, dynamic equilibrium means, yeah, look at where, where do we need growth? We need some kind of growth in decent, good, affordable housing. I think most of us might agree on that one. Decent, good, affordable housing is a basic need that we haven't provisioned. And we have to look at the root sources of that incapacity. And the other growth is that those who have a degree of basic needs well met often want time. They want growth in time, time to be with their family, their friends, their interests, their hobbies, time to enjoy life. That is not a growth that's going to take any resources. It's a growth that we can get. That's a psychological and, if you will, spiritual growth that improves the human being on uh, multi dimensions of our self. Uh, if we don't have this heavy burden of paying rent and mortgage for a basic necessity like housing. So it certainly relates to the very skewed and unfair distribution of wealth and all these core issues that we'll be addressing, but the dynamic equilibrium, and in terms of renewable energy, there's gonna be a variety of views on that, uh, but we could, certainly could touch into that. I happen to think that the subsidies that through our income and, and, and through the federal government, the billions of dollars of subsidies to oil and uh, high uh, uh, resource use industries, is just plain wrong. It's not harnessing the incentives, incentives we need for renewable energy. So without even uh, maybe having to right now address, is there gonna be, what's the timeline for renewable energy to replace fossil fuels? We may be able to agree that stopping subsidizing uh, the fossil fuel energy uh, industry Will uh, and, and taking off the disincentives for those who are developing, creating, and want to capitalize renewable energy could certainly get us there a lot more quickly. And, and that has uh, uh, as well to look at a very important issue for us, which is what is our uh, relationship to the tax dollars from our hard earned efforts that go to government, particularly the federal government. What is that relationship and, and how do we feel about the extraction of wealth from our work and how the federal government's expenditure budgets look like at this point? Is it a moral dilemma for any of us? Does it cause any kind of anguish? It certainly does for me and I'd be interested in hearing how it does for others. Uh, but let's see before we go on to uh, the other question about our principles and policies that we think will get us to post-COVID economics. Anybody else want to give some input? Or have we mentioned, have we touched on all the major crises that we can uh, articulate right now, the major economic and social crises? Yeah, I am. Um have my hand up and uh, I am almost depressed listening to the long list, uh, but I'll add what I think. Um, uh, monetary reform, I think uh, uh, the banks have to be reeled in and uh, the government has to have access to the funds it needs without building up all this debt and we need monetary reform to uh, make a lot of these things happen and to allow the government to have the resources to address the many issues that have just been listed. Good, we definitely want to look at the money system, how it's structured. And we're going to use this lens called the commons at times. What is the commons? 
is 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 money properly put into the realm of the commons? Should money be thought of and structured as a fair share infrastructure? Uh, very different than the way the money systems is now. So um, I want to also present my interest or my bias, if you will, uh, to say that I'm a strong decentralist. Uh, I'm for structuring the economy, both land, tax, and banking money, so that we have um, maximum capacity to meet our basic needs within the footprint of our, our regions and localities. And if you look at our fundamental basic needs, most regions have the capacity for food, housing, shelter, and then of course, education, healthcare. So uh, I see some realm for uh, national governance, but much reduced from what we have now and a minimal type of global governance. I mean, the oceans are not a nation state, but they're used by corporations for profit. There's all sorts of transnational resources that we need some policies and principles. I've called for a global resource agency. Uh, and I might mention in my book, I, I have some um, sections on the global resource energy, I'm sorry, global resource authority idea. So I thought through this quite a bit. How do we decentralize and minimally have global governance? So any more on this thre thread, uh, kind of go once, twice, and then we're moving on to another question. And I want you all to pay attention to the like multitasking of looking at comments in the chat where you can have side conversations that can be very useful. Okay, I think I would like to move on to uh, what in your view are some principles, principles and policies uh, that you think will get us to a world that works for everyone, a post COVID economics. So dream away with your principles and policies because we wanna shoot for the stars so that we have maximum capacity to destructure this terrible inequitable system that we're now living under and move into something that makes sense for everybody. Okay, so what's principles and policies for post-COVID economics? Let's see, I'm gonna let Ibrahima moderate in terms of who's uh, given the microphone, if you will. Still here? The mic is uh, open and available to whoever wants to speak. Uh, Yanis, go ahead. Yes, uh, th uh, thank you, Alana, and thank you, Ibrahima. It's a very uh, fruitful discussion, and I think very condensed and very broad. I'm very happy about that, and I'm looking forward to the following sections where we're going to flesh out all of these issues. Um, one issue, though, that was not brought up was the role of government in forcing transactions and that will go so, so that was in the previous like what causes crisis but it goes back it goes to the next question alana of what principles we should have so one fundamental principle i think we cannot do without is the freedom of association which translates also to the freedom of transaction which means the freedom to say yes to a transaction, but also the freedom to say no to a transaction, and nobody can transact on my behalf behind my back, which is unfortunately what has been happening this past year with the money being printed out, um, uh, government buying vaccines on our behalf, but without on our consent, and that's that's so 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 the principle of economic freedom i think is one of that we cannot it's a sine qua non it's something we cannot do without and you know i'm going to want to look at even how that applies to taxation policy which is going to be a big key we're going to look at 
I mean, what what happens if you say I'm I want freedom not to pay this tax that you guys recommend? And we're going to look at a way to work with even that freedom. Let, let, um, let, let, let me say a quick example on this with the rents. Now, many people either by choice or uh, from inability, they cannot pay the rents. I think Cuba mentioned that, right? And then what happens? Government comes in and says, oh, the poor landlords, I'm going to pay their high rents that the renters are not paying. It gets even worse. If you were able to negotiate your rent down, we are talking a free market transaction now with your landlord. The landlords are going to claim that free market decrease in rent as an income loss, and they will write it off from their taxes. Okay? That's not a free market. That's the government coming and bailing out landlords. So the landlords cannot take the money from me, the renter, but they're going to have their government give it to, 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 to them on my behalf. That's not a free market economy. That's the insidious and nefarious role of government that, that I'm calling out for. And we should be cautious about, especially those that think that government is the solution. Government is the problem, is the source of the problem, not for the same reason that Reagan phrase that that, that 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 sentence but because government goes and is in cahoots with the elite and the rent seekers good uh the way i usually look at this is there is another there is another question now but go ahead i'll just uh, let you finish and please. then i i want to read what manuel wrote and okay. uh the I'm... last couple chats but i want to read those but First, I want to address this government issue. Uh, there's big, big arguments about, is government too big? Do we need to shrink government, uh, drown it in the bathtub, that kind of thing. I've come to the view that it's the purpose of government is what we need to look at. And that we never gave the purpose of democratic governance to have, for instance, a fair distribution of wealth. We've never looked at a fair monetary policy in, in, in democratic governance. So uh, a new form of what it means, the purpose of, of governance, of government. And, and I, I'm going to be going into that in this class as well. So I want to read a couple of these chats. Manuel says, uh, some of the major social and economic crises I see are climate, biodiversity decline, um, uh, increasing the militarism globally, financialization and privatization of the commons, and dominance of big pharma in government policy making everywhere. I love that list. I, I think it's a very inclusive list. Uh, I've been really looking at this big pharma problem. I did a webinar a few months ago uh, titled The Corruption of uh, Economics and Medicine. Uh, that's a YouTube uh, and, and I trace the uh, origins of both corruptions to the same players in about the same time period in the early 1900s of how the big money people corrupted both economics and the medical system. Uh, if you want to look at that, I think it's a real important issue. Uh, distinguish between uh, politics and philosophy. Marx was a labor activist and George were all philosophers. And uh, Michael Hudson, of course, he's making the point that Marx was a classical economist. And he's telling Marxists that they should read Marx's second and third books of Das Kapital, where he has some major focus on the land and land rent problem. Uh, let's see. Paul says, if Georgism had been implemented before the time of Marx, the defense of the labor class may not have been such a pressing issue. I happen to think if we fully address the land problem and claim the land rent commons for the people, that there would be many small businesses, individual and family businesses, and that larger businesses would quite naturally, not coercively, but more so take the form of cooperative ownership 
Richard writes, I understand the appeal of local currencies, but from a strict legal perspective, wages cannot be taken out of the income tax base if they are received in banknotes. Uh, so my idea of a post-COVID remedial policy would be monetary reform and the legal and the legal ability to receive wages in treasury direct currency, especially finding lawyers willing and able to help the wage earner assert the property rights and wages. Uh, that's uh, a, a big look at all of this. Um, I've been in, in pretty deep discussion with leaders of the Public Bank and Banking Institute, and we're looking at how uh, tax dollars could be put into uh, decentralized public banks. Uh, and then uh, there would be a pool of money at very low interest rates for the local people to be able to borrow, to get out of the usurious uh, interest of the banks. Um, I've just been reading about uh, John McAfee after he's already passed, uh, been suicided, you know, in the jail, jail in Spain. You know who I mean? John McAfee. And I just uh, heard him talk about cryptocurrencies and how the use of cryptocurrencies will absolutely disable governments from collecting income tax. So I thought, well, that's interesting because the income tax, some say passed in 1913 is not really legal, but it's certainly how it has the noose around the neck of working people rather than having a commons rent based public finance. And you can escape all these payments. The uh, Somebody mentioned uh, Chuck Collins' new book uh, talking about all these uh, offshore hidden bank accounts, uh, but you can't hide the land. And with uh, land value maps, you can see who's paying what land rent into the commons, into the public purse. So uh, that's a real powerful tool that, that I want us to really look at and see the potential of um, land value based uh, public finance using all the technologies that we now have to do that in order to address this huge concentration of wealth at the top. So uh, some see in terms of local currencies, what makes any currency of great value is when you can use that currency to pay taxes. So if we can envision a decentralized economy where there's maybe a decentralized currency that the local government would accept at least in part to pay your land rent taxes, land value tax commons rent. That would empower the use of a local based currency right there. And then uh, we, there can be regional and, and international or global currencies. It wouldn't, be impossible to put together a system that enabled at least three different levels of trade. And you could pick which ones are the fairest, which ones work for you. But I think we have something really coming down the pike with these cryptocurrencies, because uh, a lot of people are going to go into that and escape income tax entirely. And then they're going to look at, going to need to look at how do we, we how do we fund uh, the legitimate needs of, of governance, of our basic uh, common uh, goods, uh, transportation, for instance, education, perhaps health care is in there. So, Alana, uh, Tom, Ross, Tom Rossman has a question. In. Tom Rossman has a question, Alana. Okay. Go, Go ahead, Tom. It. Hi. Sorry, my... Uh, my my uh, headset gave up the ghost, so if you if you can't hear me, just let me know. Um, basically, I think clear. there's I think there's there's two there's two basic problems. We're talking about principles. I could not agree with you more in in the clarity of purpose and understanding what the purpose of government is is very essential. And it, and I go back to Henry George, you know, in Progress and Poverty, and 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 it it strikes me that you know the most powerful phrase I think in that book is with all of the the immense wealth being created and the and the technological advancements of the age right and he's talking about the 1870s um why is there still so much poverty around and i think if government focused on that notion that with all the wealth and, and, and technological advancements that are taking place in our age which is even 
exponentially greater than what was happening in the 1870s, um, um, you know, we would have a new perspective. And I think it comes down to two different things. And Ibrahim and I have talked about this. Basically, uh, Robert Schiller, the Nobel Prize uh, uh, laureate, um, wrote a book about economic narratives. And he talked about the fact that the narratives that are dominant in society um, are, are, are essential to the way that people interact both with the government and with uh, uh, each other in, in the economy. And if you think about the last uh, 40 years, we've been living in the age of, of uh, the, the uh, Friedman Doctrine, uh, where corporations, the purpose of corporations was to, was to generate profits, period, that's it. Um, not treat, no matter how badly they treated workers or how unfair they were, it, it, no matter how bad the products were, um, their purpose was to, to, to generate profits. And we're now sort of coming out of that. So we need to, in my opinion, we need to have a new economic narrative that's a much more inclusive, much more fair approach. And, and, and of course the land value taxes is one of the, the principal ways that we could do that because of all the rent seeking that's taking place with large landowners making money off of the growth of communities and making money off the growth of infrastructure. So we need a, a new narrative about economics and we need a new narrative about government because uh, you know, in the, in the early 1960s, um, the approval of government, the trust in government was, was in, the 70, in the mid 70s. So three quarters of the American population trusted the government to do the right thing most, uh, all of the time or most of the time. And that, that number has fallen precipitously um, into the, the, the mid 20s. And so um, we need a new narrative about uh, the economy and we need a new narrative about how government interacts with society and the important role it can, it can have in, in mitigating some of this, this tremendous inequality that's taking place in wealth and income. And we've done this, you know, historically, if you look at it, we've done this twice before, right? The first time was the Gilded Age. And then we had the Progressive Era, which addressed the problems. And again, in the 1920s, but we didn't address the problems. And we had to go through the Great Recession to get through that, that critical period. So we're, we're at an inflection point today. And the way that we choose, if, if we choose a, a new economic narrative, a new narrative about government, we can come out of this period in, in, in a much better way, uh, but if we don't, I fear that that you know a crisis similar to the Great Depression is uh, is inevitable. I, I like your call, Tom, and let's take it upon ourselves for those of us so interested and willing in this little class of ours to begin to verbalize and write the new economic and governance narrative. There's no reason why we can't put out a statement by the end of our class here that encapsulate all the key points that we think are important because it needs to be a lots of small groups with some clarity. And I, I'm kind of gauging as I'm listening to, to all of you, um, the level or depth of uh, exposure you've already had to Henry George economics. And it seems that many of you have had had some and some quite a bit. Uh, I'd be curious to know who out there has no clue about who Henry George is, uh, because that's important too. We want to make sure we all move through this together. Uh, for instance, when Giannis in chat talks about some of the issues about what you call a general income tax or a land value income tax, uh, the issue between uh, wealth that goes to, to, to labor. Uh, he's, he's coming out of the three-factor economics. So I think I want to just mention that, that the original science of political economics, classical economics had three terms, land, labor, and capital. Land being all the gifts of nature, uh, labor being the usual sense, uh, what we work for with our mental and physical labor, and capital, we're not thinking money or finance capital here, we're just thinking tools that help us create more wealth. So if I take my labor and I find some minerals and I find some wood and I make a shovel 
And with my shovel raker hoe, I can therefore be more productive in my garden. Uh, I've become a working capitalist. But if some people do not allow me fair share rights to the land resources to put that shovel together or even to grow a garden, then I'm at a disadvantage. So what the um, neo neoliberal economists did, the corruption of economics, was to take those three terms, land, labor, and capital, and then see how wealth gets returned to the factor of who owns land and resources and who has simply their wage labor and uh, who owns uh, capital. And uh, he sees that the land problem is the predominant problem in that as an economy grows, becomes more complex, as more people gather into um, cities and combine their labors together, that the land value increases faster than the return to wages. It's called the law of rent. The law of rent is key to classical economics. It was a big, big uh, focus of concern for the classical economists. Who gets the rent? Who gets the free lunch? looking thereby at earned income versus unearned income. And this is a really helpful tool when we look at uh, business. You, you notice if you come from a very left analysis uh, in, and if it's an anti-corporate overall stance, uh, you often don't have much of a remedy for how we strengthen small businesses uh, of people with earned income. So goods and service producers and their earned income uh, versus the companies that simply own so much of the land and resource base and thus are in power positions to collect enormous amount of unearned income. Back again to this article I pointed to earlier from commondreams.org. It's just from today. Alabama miners take strike to Black Rock's New York City headquarters. Well, having been a so-called YMCA volunteer in Appalachia as a young woman, I uh, and then through my uh, analyses through Georgia's economics, I came to see that a lot of mineral resources are simply owned by companies that are not even the ones putting together the labor and capital to extract the, the resources, say, in Appalachia. And Appalachia has been like an internal third world. The wealth, poor wealth distribution has been an issue for decades in the Appalachian region, as it is, of course, in, in, the, in, the, in the cities. But let's look at just the Appalachian region, where you have very significant uh, resource wealth, but the paper owners, often in New York or Chicago, the paper ownership owning companies collecting the rent from the companies that then organize labor and capital to get the resources out of the ground. So there is a clarity around uh, the, the unearned income that comes with simply your ownership rights to land and resources. That's what we're majorly questioning. I think that's the narrative that's been put forward around private property rights. And our narrative, what is yours, what is mine, and what is rightfully ours. And back to classical economics, we would say what is yours is what you work for. You want to work and grow those vegetables in your garden, they're all yours. You can trade them or sell them or or just eat all your vegetables yourself. I have no right either directly through theft or through a government structure of income tax to take your productive wealth away from you. So yours is what you make for, make my, what's mine is what I make. So that's yours and mine. And what about the hours? Well, if one of us has much more land and resources than the rest of us, you're always going to be an advantage over the rest of us. So we have to look at the land question and we have to look at how people like Bill Gates come to then own more agricultural land in the United States than anybody else. In fact, anyone who gets so far ahead into the billionaire class, whether it's through a enclosure of patent rights uh, and theft in a way and enclosure of patents, as I think uh, Bill Gates did it primarily, 
But whenever you get to that high, high so-called income level, high wealth level, you'll find their portfolios usually include investment in land and real estate. Point, in fact, back again to BlackRock buying up the housing stock and inflating the cost for everybody else who needs housing. So this three-factor economics, land, labor, and capital is absolutely crucial. And uh, many of you who've been exposed to Georgia's economics know how crucial this distinction is in understanding wealth distribution. Uh, many people will say claw back from the top. And that's a big calling out right now, isn't it? It's uh, I'm getting petitions. I'm supposed to sign on to say tax the rich, tax the rich. OK, it's a good idea if you can do it, because certainly a lot of the unearned income is at the top in the billionaire class. But as has been pointed out, they find all kinds of ways to hide that wealth in all kinds of offshore shelters and in legal shenanigans to uh, come out paying no taxes whatsoever. So what we love about land and resource based taxes is it's very concrete. It's very much right there. Is something we can look at who owns what land and resources and if we address the land problem and we start getting affordable housing we start getting a very natural kinds of land reform that we can point to as an example i will later on in the class of how a land value based public finance created a magnificent land reform then uh we're not uh caught in this web of uh having to uh to compete with other people for uh, wages, for jobs. And Anna, so we gain uh, our freedom, I come to see quite clearly, when we gain more, our land rights. You have three more so, people waiting to ask questions. Anna. Okay, very good. Thanks, okay. Ibrahima. Uh, let's go with uh, Joe and then Ron. Okay. Joe. I hope he's still Joe. around. Joe Polito, he's coming yeah, on. I'm here. <laughs> um, uh, you mentioned uh, cryptocurrencies, and um, you also asked us about policies we thought you know we should go that might help address some of these yeah. issues you raised. And I think um, <clears throat> CBDCs should be on our list. Um, I've put in the in the chat uh, a link to a Bank of Spain. Um, paper, which talks about CBDCs and sort of the stages of introduction, and it eventually shows that it could be uh, a good pathway to a Chicago plan. And, uh, you know, the NEED Act, and uh, doesn't mention the NEED Act, but that kind of thinking and <clears throat> a way of getting control of the monetary system. Uh, and as well, it would help us to avoid the uh, kind of Wild West show that uh, all these cryptocurrencies would lead to their kind of libertarian free banking mechanisms, which would make things worse and <clears throat> increase the rentier economics. So uh, that would be one policy I'd recommend that we promote uh, CBDCs. Um, <clears throat> essentially, it would be a way to 100% money. Thank you. Great. I may ask, you what, put, what is CBDC? Yeah. Okay, sorry, central bank Question digital Question to, to Joe. Okay. That's, uh, central bank digital currency. Digital currency. Okay, thanks. And, and the paper is all, you know, does a good job of explaining it and <clears throat> the potential. All right. Uh, Alana, you want to answer that before we give it to Ron? Let's give it to Ron. Um, because that central bank digital currencies is a really big enchilada here. <laughs> it's going to take some time to unpeel that one. So we're, we're at uh, Ron. Okay, Alana, I just want to briefly discuss the, the issue that was raised earlier about the size of government and perhaps the functions of government. Uh -huh. and, um, we, you asked the question, the third question was uh, principles. So I want to uh, introduce a principle uh, in relation to the size and functions of government. And it, it, the, the code for it is one word. And it, the word is subsidiarity. And I'm gonna define what subsidiarity means in, uh, I'm paraphrasing in, in very sort of uh, 
common layman terms, but the principle of subsidiarity is that nothing should be done by a larger entity that can be done by a smaller entity. So this is a principle that very much aligns with decentralization. Mm -hmm. That um, uh, the anything that can be handled, for example, at the local level, any issues at the local level should be left there. Uh, if it can't and it needs to go up to the next level of the, the district, county, state, you know, it continues to rise up de depending on the uh, complexity and the interdependence of the issues, all the way up, not only to the level of uh, sovereign nation states, but even to the issue of uh, planetary governance, that there are some issues, for example, that need to be worked out between all the uh, national sovereign states together on the planet. But um, as we discuss the role of government and how to um, distribute power, if we, if we could just keep in mind the principle of subsidiarity, I think it helps to uh, give a, a good framework for uh, discussing who should be doing what. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Very important principle. I agree with, with you and that that's very important. Great. Thanks, Ron. Any other questions or comments? Let me look at the chat. Richard, you are very uh, active in the chat. Do you have a question or a comment? I, thanks, Ibrahim. I, I, I do, but I'm afraid it's going to be too uh, legal and technical to be understood. <laughs> I just stick to the chat. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Well, we, have, we have lawyers. They'll be happy to uh, to break it down <laughs> because Ron, Ron just brought a, a concept uh, in law. The subsidiarity concept actually is, is very well established in law. And uh, if you study the European Union, what we call droit communautaire, community law, uh, that basically shapes the relationship between the European Commission and individual member states. One of the key principles is subsidiarity. So the commission, which means that the commission would intervene only on matters that are beyond what individual states could do. But I understand what you are saying is we should go even deeper and do it at the intra level, you know, locally, like shaping the relationship between uh, central government and local government and, and so on. Well, well, George was strictly a greenbacker. Uh, he believed that the U.S. notes, which are greenbacks, uh, should be the only currency. So I, I guess that would translate to local power also. Uh, it, but uh, it, it, Cong it puts Congress in charge of the currency only. And so digital currencies and uh, cryptocurrencies would, would not be uh, something that I think George would approve of. In fact, uh, Thomas Sherman, his lawyer, called them sham currencies. There was a movement for... Uh, for uh, free banking back then, uh -huh. uh, wildcat banking to re restore it, but uh, they call it sham currency. Uh, Freedom for sham currency was the title of Sherman's article. He posted in the the Standard. So, but uh, but cryptos are very very popular, so it's it's hard to talk about against them. But yeah, it's it's still very new. We, I think there is a lot, to, a lot to learn about it before we can even say whether it's it's a good policy or not. But the IRS doesn't ignore them. It treats them as uh, cap. When you make a gain in cryptos, they, they treat it as a capital gain. Capital they will, gain. Okay. They will never treat it as a currency, though. So. Yeah, it's it's more or more or more more or less used as an as an asset. Yeah. Yeah. Like an investment. Yeah, stock. Or something. Well, the way McAfee was talking about it. John McAfee, if that's the right way, McAfee. Um, you know, he he invented the McAfee uh, virus software, antivirus software, and yeah. he was quite quite a renegade. I mean, he was just uh, probably murdered, suicided in a prison in Spain. Uh, uh, he was wanted. He, he he was finding all sorts of ways not to pay U.S. income tax, yeah. so that made him a target. 
but he's a wild guy, you know, and he, he was just saying over, he was seeing the cryptocurrencies he was talking about is absolutely viable for everybody you, everybody to buy and sell whatever they want to buy and sell in exchange with anybody else in the world. Yeah. So I agree with Ibrahim that there's a lot for us to learn about it. But I think the, the key takeaway I have is that, wow, what, talk about a way to get maybe get out of uh, a wage tax. So I want to look at somebody said um, Warren has a question. About the Govian tax. I want to okay. Let me let me read this one from Paul the, 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 just the, the, briefly, the, the, and then right, go, go to the go next ahead, question. Alana. Well, Paul had written uh, uh, on top of the land value tax. Uh, feel like we can also use Pigovian carbon tax on individuals or companies that are creating negative externalities or self-imposed Tobin tax or cryptocurrencies, absolutely, uh, green taxes, uh, pollution taxes. I've always put that in the mix. Uh, the, the, the challenge there is uh, along with just simply um, imposing them and uh, enforcing them uh, is if they work, if pollution taxes work to limit, uh, decrease, tax, de decrease pollution, then you lose your tax base. So it's real important that we think uh, post-COVID economics very holistically about the dynamics of the different kinds of incentives that we want in terms of environmental protection, environmental restoration, uh, addressing social problems and certainly wealth inequality. Gotta have a really holistic view to how through uh, public finance incentives and dis incentives we can incentivize. I like to think how we can hatch many birds out of one egg. You know, I think we can with properly structured public finance address many major problems. Okay, so there was a question. Or in uh, Warren, go ahead. And then Yanis. Yeah, essentially the problem with the crypto is the... Um, they will take up all the power that the earth can generate to, to mine all the cryptocurrencies. This is the, this is the, this is the downfall, but the structure and the design of the blockchain is what the, what the is really um, good for, for humanity. We could do a global currency through the blockchain. And that's, that what that's one of the Katarina Pistor's um, solutions is, is, a global currency based on the blockchain technology because blockchain cannot be hacked. So that's, 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 that's what that could be. Yeah. 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 If so you come I, across a really good article for, for us on that, uh, if, if not now, could you uh, bring it next week and post it, post it for us? Well, there, there's, a, she's been doing a lot of great interviews recently and her book is just it's extraordinary the how well it's received and also kate's book the donut economic has been translated into 26 different languages so it, it is really going global and it's really a lot of people like philadelphia and portland and amsterdam and there are 400 more cities and, and municipalities that are that are coming online to her ideas so and they are Apparently they know they know each other, um, Pistor and, and Rayworth. So. Uh, and I want to say, and I'm going to want to be comparing that those efforts with what I see is very positive is that uh, city council members and so on here and there are starting to put together the land value tax and the public banks together as solutions. So let's keep learning and comparing these different systems. I just saw somebody who had a hand raised, and now I don't see her anymore. Was uh, it it was, Ahmed? It was, it was Warren, uh, but Yanis is uh, is coming. No, there was another. There was a woman's had her hand up. I did not see that. Let's see if I can. It's only Yanis. Go ahead, Yanis. Oh, Fatima, Fatima, did you have your hand up? Fatima, I thought she did, but you're welcome to speak. <laughs> Go ahead, Yanis. Okay. Yeah, I had uh, uh, several comments uh, on on the cryptocurrencies, but let me first say something on on what Ron said about subsidiarity. 
which is a very profound comment and and a principle that would lead back to the relocalization of the economy instead of the globalization. That's something that you also said, Alana, uh, in the beginning, that all value in the economy should be growing from local to global. Now we have the opposite. The global oppresses the local, but everything is done should, should be done on the local level. Now, the, 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 the concept of the subsidiarity runs against a very common vanilla practice in the world of finance, which is mergers and acquisitions. And what do the mergers and acquisitions do? They take something that a small company or corporation can do, and they take it from them and they make it part of a big vampire squid of a corporation. That happens in big tech, that happens in finance, that happens in energy, that happens everywhere. And that's how we end up with this humongous corporations, which now they rival and actually they're more powerful than governments and they're a big threat to democracy. So illegalizing mergers and acquisitions is would be a very important step. And mergers and acquisitions stymie competition because the main incentive, the main uh, motivation for the big corporations to swallow the, 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 the smaller ones is so that they, they will not grow to be competitors to them. So that's anti-capitalist, and I'm surprised that mergers and acquisitions have not been vilified by any politicians, especially those that, that vilify Wall Street. Okay, that's the, 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 the point on subsidiarity. Now, on the cryptocurrencies, the currencies are also local. We should not have a global currency. Values are local. And different communities have different sets of values and that should be welcome to do so instead of being dominated and colonized by, by, by global currencies and the imperiums that control them. The same thing is with the dollar and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, so the thing of a global currency, I think it's antithetical to the set of principles that we should be aiming at for, 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 for economic justice and a fair world. And the thing about cryptos is we realize they're not that crypto, okay? The, the crypto is a misnomer. Governments recently were able to find out who was behind some uh, cryptocurrency transactions. So there is no crypto, there is no security, at least at this point. So we shouldn't put too much faith into them. Because the, the, the cryptocurrencies could be sources for rent seeking. In other words, you see all these people, they put all their hard earned dollars behind Bitcoin, let's say, and the Bitcoin goes up and down. There is nothing productive uh, connected with Bitcoin except being very environmentally unfriendly, as Warren said very, very, very uh, succinctly. Because what's the point to spend all this energy? in these, um, uh, you know, server farms in order to be digging for some nebulous mathematical equation. And what is the economic value of that? It's nothing. Okay. It's like going um, uh, and digging for gold and then burying it. It makes no economic sense to follow the model of cryptocurrencies. Okay. They're, they're, they're just a, a speculation vehicles. And I don't think it's something that the way it's practiced today is something that we should go after. And um, uh, the last point I was going to say with cryptocurrencies is that there was a guy that had billions worth in cryptocurrencies, in Bitcoin, I think, and all of a sudden, he was found dead. And what happened? All these billions, they disappeared. It's like burning our money. What's the point of that? So we should be looking into it, but we shouldn't, we should be very cautious and not trust them way more, further than we can throw them. That's my point. Thank you. All right. Uh, I guess that's the only question that was on the line. Uh, if you want to make some concluding remarks, you are free to go ahead, Alana. Maybe introduce uh, the next session. We have nine more. Okay. Minutes. 
Okay, so thank thank you everybody. I, I noticed in the chat some of you said you weren't in a position to to unmute, but you would use the chat. So fortunately, we have a number of options to communicate here. I'm certainly going to copy and paste into a document what everybody said in the chat. <laughs> I, I made some notes as you were talking too. In order to chart our way forward, uh, next week we're we'll probably um, I'll probably summarize our uh, responses to the questions we've uh, we've been addressing in this session, and then uh, put together the PowerPoint in such a way as to begin to dive deep into uh, how principles and what the principles and policies. Uh, that can be helpful in truly uh, addressing our major uh, crises, economic and social crises. Um, we might want to start with uh, the housing issue, since that's one thing that probably burdens most of us in one way or the other. And uh, to help us further see what we mean when we talk about the land problem, so along with doing a little research for homework on what this huge mega company called BlackRock is all about. Uh, you might just do a little search on the land problem and uh, see what you come up with. Uh, because one thing is for us to get our, our views in a place where we can have some depth of understanding and agreement of even how to articulate what we mean by the land problem and how to address the land problem, the roots of it, how it manifests, how it impacts us now, uh, how we can trace it to a number of uh, the economic and social problems that we've identified. And then importantly, um, how can we, the people, we are the many, they are the few. <laughs> That's the question, isn't it? We are the many those wealth uh, accumulators at the top multi-billionaire level, they are the few. And when we, the many, figure out what to do, we can really move forward. So that's uh, my intention for this class, is that by the last session, many of us in the class, or at least a good handful of us, will continue to work together in building these movements. And I'm going to be talking about a uh, uh, how we uh, have a focus on the city of Baltimore in the state of Maryland uh, to bring in a very um, holistic approach to decentralizing the economy down to the community level. Uh, so thank you for your time and attention tonight. Um, I really look forward to moving along this post-COVID economics journey together with you all. And I'm going to figure out a way, maybe post it, but I want to link, have you have a link to my book, which is uh, you can get as a free PDF. Uh, but let me make sure I get the right link for you and send that out. It's, my book is a uh, 30 articles and essays that I wrote over a number of years. And uh, it really does touch upon not, not maybe the monetary issue has not been a strength of mine. Uh, but on many of the other things we've addressed at subsidiarity, for instance, um, the role of governance. So a lot of the issues we brought up tonight, I, I, I do write about it in my book called The Earth Belongs to Everyone. So I think that'll be a helpful accompaniment to the class. All right. Thank you for your attention and your time again, your input. Thank you, Alana. Thank you, Alana. See you next week. Thank you, Alana, and thank you, everyone, for coming. And uh, we look forward to seeing you for session two. But just to remind you that Ted Gordney is starting his class next Monday on assessing land values. So please register if you haven't done so and try to join us. Good night. Bye. -bye.